Exodus chapter 40, I'll begin by reading that whole chapter, Exodus 40. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with a veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick, and light the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door of the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. And thou shalt set up the court round about, and hang up the hanging at the court gate. And thou shalt take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is therein, and shalt hallow it and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels, and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. And thou shalt anoint the laver and his foot, and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water, and shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt bring his sons, and clothe them with coats, and thou shalt anoint them, as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle, and fastened his sockets, and set up the boards thereof, and put in the bars thereof, and reared up his pillars, and spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and the covering of the tent above upon it, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation, upon the side of the tabernacle northward, without the veil. And he set the board in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the garden, the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil, and he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle, and he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and put water there to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, when they came near unto the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So this is the next part in our series, Put to Death, talking about sins of divine service. Sins of divine service. So 
the term divinity or divine is a general and broad term, okay? So this just deals with God or gods, right? And the service to them. Specifically, divine is just referring to of or about or in regard to God or God. So anything spiritual by nature, right? So obviously, divine is not necessarily a biblical word. In fact, when you find it, it's usually used in a, a negative connotation where it, it talks about divination which is the, the consulting with or the working with, the manipulating of familiar spirits. Those would be the lowercase g gods that the Bible talks about. Devils. And divination is the way that somebody gets a hold of them and uses them for their own benefit. So divine service then is just the service to something spiritual. Okay, so that's just a general term and you can have sins in both areas. You can have sins where you're divining with devils. You can also have sins of divine service in regard to the Lord Most High, our God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, right? You can sin in the area of servicing Him. Now, when servicing our divine God, um, divine can be referred to also as a secondary definition of just excellent or delightful. It's, it's a high term, divinity, okay? And God expects that when we serve Him, we would do it in an ordered and, and pristine, and He says, holy fashion. When he says, be ye holy, for I, the Lord, am holy, he's talking about how when you come into my presence and serve me, you ought to do it in such a way that it reflects me, the one that you're serving. You ought to be holy, for I, the Lord God, am holy. And so this area of put to death, or capital punishment, it almost seems to have a, a higher um, degree of seriousness in association. When you think about violence, doing that to other humans, that's not right, of course. Rebellion, rebelling against the natural order, rebelling against uh, leadership, it's not a good thing either. Sins of the flesh, fornication. The Bible says when you sin in the area of fornication, you do so against your own body, right? These aren't good things, but sinning against the holy God when you're setting out to serve Him, it almost seems like it's got an entirely different connotation to it. I believe so. <clears throat> What could be worse than again as sinning against our God when you're trying to serve Him? Or when serving some other supposed deity in His place? It's taking away everything that is God's and deserving of God from Him. He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be uh, feared. He deserves to be respected and put in the highest of categories of importance in everybody's life, right? He came to this earth in the Garden of Eden and created men for the purpose of fellowship with him, that they would serve him. They would have that connection and that bond with him. And so when we take what he says and don't do it, or we go and give his proper place to someone else, I believe it's one of the utmost of, of disrespects towards our righteous God that we could ever do, is to sin in the area of divine service to him, or give that service to someone else. And nowhere do we find that more true than in looking at what we just read in the Old Testament and with regard to the service of the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, I read in Exodus chapter 40 just an overview of basically everything that happened beforehand. And if you've read Exodus recently or ever, you know that it's a very exciting book in the first portion. You know, lots of exciting battles, things are going on, there's action, there's activity. And then it gets to the end of Exodus and he starts talking about, you know, patches and, 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 and rivets and, and hangings and coverings and, and, and furnishings and all these things that, that there is great detail in given to them. And if you look into the spiritual truths of it, it it's, it's profound how he, he typified heaven in, in something that we could, we could comprehend and touch and embrace here and work with here. But if you're not into getting into that kind of a deep study, or it's not a mood you're in, when you're going through just your Bible reading, sometimes those can be a little bit dry and a little bit difficult to get through, right? But God gives them particularly and specifically for such a reason as he's exemplifying his holiness and his righteousness and how he demands that there be due process steps and particular items in regard to servicing him. He wants to highlight the fact that it's a detailed and orchestrated and ordered and proper, holy service that you are doing when you come before me. And so, 
like you read in verse 34 of that chapter, Exodus 40, he says, then, after all of these things were complete, and if you go into every one of these as the Lord commanded Moses, you can go a few chapters back and you're going to find just details upon details upon details, who, that according to our flesh, sometimes we just, oh, is it ever going to be over? He's talking about this and that and these details, right? It's very hard sometimes for our flesh to stomach, but after it was all completed and, and, and highlighted here and then Moses did as he was commanded, verse 34 comes out and said then so after all this was completed as the Lord commanded then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the temple once the order of service was completed then the glory of God entered in and the glory of God was such that verse 35 records and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God's glory and presence was such that after they had done as was commanded, when he entered in, they couldn't even go near this thing because of the power of God fulfilling and filling that area, that space. And so God puts a special um, a promise and a special desire of man and a special command to man to keep his service holy. God's tabernacle was holy, and then God entered in, and now it's most holy. And it's most holy, why? Because His very presence is there. If you, if you wanted to, you'd go to Psalm 100. I'm just going to read it. Psalm 100, verse 2, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And that sounds wonderful. With gladness of heart and rejoicing with singing. Come before the presence of God. And that's what we do when we come. We serve Him. We sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs before Him. We ought to do it with a joyful and glad heart. And that would be proper and good for us to do. Also, though, at the same time, look at Psalm 2 and verse 11, where it says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. What is this fear and trembling? That's because, like Moses described, he couldn't even get to the presence of God for the glory that was there. And so while we do serve Him with a rejoicing heart and with singing and with gladness, and we serve Him in the same capacity and with rejoicing, we ought to do it with fear and trembling when we think about how holy and righteous our God is. Mm. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. This tabernacle was a special place for the nation of Israel. It was to be held in the highest of regard. He also set forth that certain items would be used in the service within that tabernacle, and also that certain men would be involved in the order of service that was done there. So the first area that I want to look at, and you can go to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1, where you are, you'll just skip over Leviticus, and Numbers 1 will be right there, to the right. Numbers chapter 1, the first area where somebody can find themselves put to death in regard to divine service is having the wrong method of serving God or the wrong man is involved in the service of God. Numbers chapter 1, look at verse 47. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 47. It says, But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them. For the Lord had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony, and over all the vessels thereof, and over all things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. Verse 51, And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. God particularly selected these people out of all the tribes of Israel to be the ones that took down and put up the tabernacle. They were to be over all the vessels, over all the things that pertained unto it. They were to bear the tabernacle. That gives you that, that connotation of, of holding it, having it weigh down upon them. And literally they did that when they carried it and traveled about. They bore that thing 
Also they were to minister unto it. Over it, bear it, minister unto the tabernacle was the desire of God for these particular people. And the stranger that approacheth thereunto was to be put to death. God said, these are the people that are ordered to do the job. And anybody else, any stranger, any foreigner, anybody that does not belong, that approaches near unto, shall be put to death. God chose these men particularly, and having the wrong man perform the job is something that specifically in the Old Testament required that death would happen. Numbers chapter 3, you can turn it over, Numbers chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, we have an example of this. Numbers 3 and verse 1. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, Nebihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. And they had no children. And Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron their father. So the order, of course, is of particular importance because here they offered something that was strange, something that was foreign in the fire that was before the Lord. And Nadab and Abihu, the Bible records here, died as a result of it. There is a proper order of things. There is a scripturally supported fire that was supposed to be used, and they ignored that and offered the strange and died as a result. You can keep your finger there in Numbers 3. I'm going to go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. <clears throat> Another discussion of the order of things. Remember, God's telling to tell us, 2 Samuel chapter 6, that there ought to be a right method, and a right man involved in the service of God. 2 Samuel chapter 6, look at verse 1. And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from the valley of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelt between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. And that's the, that's the key phrase there. The key word is new. It shouldn't belong there. Even carts shouldn't belong there. But nevertheless, they set the ark upon a new cart. And brought it out of the house of Abinadab, that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord, and all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even harps, and on psalteries, and timbrels, and cornets, and cymbals. So the praise seems to be right. Verse 6, it says this, though, When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. And so here Uzzah, not only did they have the wrong method in putting the ark upon a cart, a new cart, and driving it to the final destination, but they also had the wrong man reaching out and touching the thing. He had the right heart, of course. Uzzah didn't want to see the ark of God fall to the ground. But nevertheless, when he put his hand out and touched it, it was looked at as an action of strange fire performed by the wrong man in the eyes of God. And he struck Uzzah dead at that time. Now they regrouped and David went to the scriptures and found that the ark was supposed to be supported by four Levites that would carry it by hand into its destination. They got it right. The songs and praises came back and it was the same. But it took learning that hard lesson that when you have the wrong method and the wrong man is used, in the Old Testament specifically, God required that he would put that to death, put that man to death. And he did it himself in this case. Now... The order is correct, needs to be correct, and also the appointed need to be correct. Go to Numbers chapter 3 again. Numbers chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 5. Numbers 3 and verse 5. And it says, and this is how and why that specific tribe of Israel, being the Levites, was chosen. Verse 5, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Numbers 3 and verse 5, 
Verse 6, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may minister unto him. So they were to be presented for the ministry. And they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of the tabernacle. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given to him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix. Among the children of Israel, therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn of Israel, both of man and beast. Mine shall they be, I am the Lord. And so God appointed these particular Levites because he had set for himself the firstborn of every tribe. And instead of just taking the firstborn son out of every family, he made things a lot simpler and took of one tribe and said, they shall just always be mine. And that way a tribe of Issachar and of Gad and of Ephraim and of Dan won't have to always be losing their firstborn and the inheritance that would go to them. But rather God just said, this tribe will be mine. And their purpose shall be to service me in the house of God. And the stranger, the imposter, the foreigner that does not belong to that tribe, if he approach unto, he shall be put to death. And so the right ordained and appointed man was to be for this particular job. We ought to fear God and serve him with that rejoicing, trembling. And this is something that is, is, is of a great importance too. Um, Numbers chapter 16, we have an example. I'll try to read through it quickly. Numbers chapter 16 is another example of the wrong men fitting themselves for a particular task. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And it's funny, whenever that statement, men of renown, comes in, it's because there's somebody that thinks that they're famous enough within the congregation that they are somehow above them and they can do whatsoever they please in that nation and in, in their lives in general. The men of renown, the princes, the famous here, come together against Moses. And what do they do? Verse 3, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. So Moses was a man that was meek, that was humble. And he saw what was happening, and he understood the trouble that was about to happen as a result of it. I wonder if Moses didn't fall upon his face for fear that God would strike them dead in that moment. And he just didn't want to be hit in the crossfire. But nevertheless, they gathered themselves together. Moses goes to God, falling upon his face, in regard to the, what this group of famous men of renown had done. They gathered themselves and they said, Hey, Moses, leader, you know, God's appointed you the boss, but, but why is it so, essentially he's saying. You take too much upon you. You're busy enough with a guy. Why don't you just disperse this responsibility to everybody? We're all holy. We are all have God with us. We can all lead. And I've heard it many times, and even in regard to in the context of church and, 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 and assemblies, and, and even in regard to like the business world. Anything with more than one head is a monster. Right? There's got to be one that is overseeing everything. Otherwise, there's always going to be division, and ultimately it will come to ruin. 
God says a house that is divided cannot stand. And so God had ordained that there were those that had an appointed job to serve in the house of God. But this isn't what the renowned men wanted to do. They didn't want to serve God. They weren't interested in, in being part of his holy convocation and, and overseeing that godliness prevailed in the congregation. No, they just wanted to be in charge and equally in charge. They wanted to spread it out like some sort of communitism or some sort of communistic mindset where we're just all equal in this. Okay, so they come to Moses and these men of renown, these famous in the congregation, these princes of the assembly. And they say, you're taking too much upon yourself. We're all holy. And Moses knew that this was a great affront to God because they were not the right men for the job. God had appointed Moses for that particular task. So in verse 6, he says, This do, take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy, ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And so these Levites were particularly chosen for the task of serving God, but they thought that they should have tasked, been tasked with something in their eyes greater than that. And that was the office that Moses was given as, as the overseer, as, as the... Uh, um, as, as the, the man of God before the congregation. So you can go down to um, verse 11. He says, For which cause both you and all the company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? Go down to verse 20. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation, this group of men of renown, this famous group, these princes, that are, that are over here thinking that they are, are, are in charge of or should be in charge of more than they ought to be. Separate yourselves from them, God says, in verse 22. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from out up about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went into David and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest he be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works. So God particularly, and spoke to Moses of that regard, God sent me to do this job, right? And now they are rising up, men of renown, thinking they're famous enough to do so, that they want to usurp what Moses was told of God that he should do. He said, know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, right? So God requires that the right works are done by the right man. We've, we're starting to learn here. And so, I have not done them, he says, from mine own mind. He's affirming to them that God told me to do these works. I didn't just dream this up. I didn't just put myself in this position. I didn't set myself above you of my own mind and of my own heart and of my own desires, but rather God sent me to do these works. Okay? That's a bold statement, right? He's got to have something to back that up, doesn't he? By and large, this was a conversation that Moses has had, and he had shown himself to be the leader of the people by his actions that followed suit. And by and large, the nation followed after him. When the signs were shown, the miracles were done, when he gave the law, when after he had talked to Moses in the mountain, after Moses had talked to God in the mountain, he affirmed his, his calling by his ministry that followed. But these men don't see it that way. These famous in the congregation, these men are renowned. And so he says in verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. So if these men just go on after today and just live as they ought, always do and just die a common death, then, then, then God hasn't appointed me. God hasn't um, sent me to do these works. I've just dreamed these up of my own mind. Look at verse 3. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that are pertain unto them, and they go down quick or alive into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. 
And so he's saying, if God does some new thing and proves himself today, then you know that what I'm saying is true. You know that my ministry is verified. You know that God sent me to do these works. If that opens up, the pit happens, they, they go down quick into hell, essentially, understand that they've provoked God in this thing. Verse 31, and it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder. That was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that are pertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they say, let the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed 250 men that offered incense. So they had taken it upon themselves to step out from under the authority that God had appointed when God had said to Moses, go and do these works. Moses affirmed that I didn't do these of my own mind and God showed himself strong in that he affirmed by a miracle and destroying those that rose up against his proper order. They were put to death, weren't they? So we see that in scriptures, those that of, of the strangers that would come unto the service of the tabernacle, they were to be put to death. This isn't your place. This isn't your opportunity. This isn't your job. It's been reserved for the Levites. And then we see also many cases where that didn't happen, but God actually took it into his own hands to take those that rose up and tried to put themselves in a position that was not theirs and put them to death of his own, uh, of his own um, hand. So the wrong method, the wrong man, in, in the service of God, will get somebody put to death. I believe the Bible is teaching. Either by the congregation in the Old Testament, or God just simply smiting those that, that rise up against his ordained leadership. Verse, uh, the second one is sins in laboring or in, in not laboring. Go to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, in the service of God, God wants us to labor. He wants us to work with our hands. Acts chapter 20, and in verse 33, we have the Apostle Paul talking. And one of the many times that he stood before um, men, whether friendlies or not, and, and gave account of his ministry. He said in verse 33 of Acts chapter 20, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Here the Apostle Paul in all of his ministry was often accused of it not being legitimate or, or him uh, just trying to gain uh, notoriety or trying to get gold or silver, be famous, all those sorts of things that Apostle Paul was always accused of. And he says, you know that I labored with my hands. You know that in doing so I was able to not only support my own necessities, but also those that were with me. I was able to support the weak. Why? Because I worked hard. I never was covetous. I never desired gain. I never thought gain would be godliness in this area. I just wanted to work hard. And that's, that's, that's a great uh, trait that you find in the Apostle Paul, is that his hands ministered. He was always laboring and working and toiling in the things of God. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. And as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, let me read Ephesians 4 and verse 28. If you're going to 1 Thessalonians 4. Ephesians 4, 28. It says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. So if you used to be a thief, drop it, cut it out, but be a hard worker. Labor with your hands. Toil in the thing which is good is, the, is what the, the letter to the Ephesians is saying. Work hard to get what you need. Be content therewith. Right? Stealing always goes with covetousness. He's also saying indirectly, drop the covetousness. Be content with what you have. In 1 Thessalonians 4, and in verse 11, the Bible says, And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. 
that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. What, what, what is the writer saying here? He's saying that honest work, right? An honest walk towards the world. You want to lack nothing in this life? Come by it honestly. How do you come by it honestly? That ye study to be quiet, shut your mouth, do your own business, your own busyness, your own job, your own what's expected of you. Work with your own hands as was commanded you. He's saying the honest way to walk in this life, even before the unbelievers, and, and the honest way to have lack of nothing in this life is to work hard in your own business. Work with these hands. Labor with your hands. That's what I have been commanding you, he affirms to the Thessalonian church. Live honestly by working hard. Okay? Now turn over the page to 2 Thessalonians and verse 3. We're still talking about put to death, being put to death. What will have a man put to death is sins in labors or not laboring. Okay? We're talking about not laboring now, of course. 2 Thessalonians 3... And in verse 6, the Bible says, Now we command you, brethren, and it's interesting because he obviously had to command them again, because here's another letter and he's going to talk about a similar topic to what we had just read. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now what was the orderly walk that we, were, we, we found before? That was working diligently with your hands in the thing that is good, right? Withdraw yourself from you that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And the tradition of the Apostle Paul was to work hard and provide for your needs, so much so that you could even care for others. Verse 7, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. He's saying that we didn't just take a free meal for nothing. But rather, when we had something given to us that sustained us, it was not received disorderly. Rather, I, pro I followed the proper order, the tradition that I taught you. And what was the tradition that I taught you? Work hard, labor, and you shall have sufficient to satisfy your needs. Verse 9 says, Not because we have not power but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Do you know what he's saying here? It's not like I didn't have power to just receive a free meal from you. Because he's saying, I, I have wrote these epistles, I have preached the word, I have labored in, in things that aren't really with my hands, right? In spiritual truths and in, and in, and in uh, teaching your minds and your spirits of things, right? So he says, I had power to receive a free meal at your hand, of course, right? But... He says he wanted to be, to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So the most important thing to Paul, and that and the reason why he labored among them, was that he was trying to show them the right example while he was preaching the truth unto them. He did both. He preached it, and he did it, so that men would follow after his example, and not just the word. So he wasn't one of these do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do type of leaders and preachers and ministers in the work of God. Verse 10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You've got to be put to death, right? If you don't eat, how long does it take you to, to famish and die off, right? He's essentially saying, don't give the free meal to the guy that isn't willing to work for it. The Apostle Paul says, I could have taken a free meal because I've labored in spiritual truths with you. I've ministered unto you in these things. But this guy over here that would not work, neither should he eat. In other words, he ought to be put to death. That'd be the, that would be one of the greatest things that our country could do as far as the welfare system goes, is to stop handing out free checks and start handing out work. Amen. Get to work. Here's your meal. Get to work. Here's your rent. Get to work. Here's your sustenance. And eventually these people connect the dots that hard work provides for my necessities. Imagine that. And then the world starts turning around and understanding that if I want something, I got to go and get it. I got to work hard for it. I got to strive for it. I got to get my hands dirty. 
Instead, we just keep giving it to people, and they never connect the dots. You know what they think is, 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 is how they get what they need? Just going, taking it, taking it, taking it. More, 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 more. And they just get that covetous mindset that the Apostle Paul is trying to rid this congregation of. Because when you work for what you need, you understand that the stuff that you're coveting is far beyond that. And if you do want that, fine and great, just work harder. Labor more. Keep at it, right? And he's trying to un give them power back to the, to the end that they could actually provide for themselves. And he's doing it by example. And if you don't want to work, neither should you eat, right? You want to just sit around and be lazy and do nothing, you shouldn't be provided for a free meal. Now this doesn't negate some of the Old Testament principles on providing for those that are mentally challenged, physically challenged, literally cannot work. This is those that would not work. In other words, I don't desire to work. I don't want to get a job. I don't want to, I don't want to lift my hand. I'm just going to sit at home and collect a check, right? That's another side effect of this whole COVID-19 garbage is we've just taken our population of hard workers and minimum them down to like about nothing. There's a lot of people now, I don't know if you heard about it, they're making more sitting at their at home in their rumps than they were making when they were actually laboring in toilet. And if you're given the opportunity, hey, do you want to go work like 10 hours a day and make 10 bucks, or do you want to sit at home and make 12? Most of the population is going to go, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, right? And they're just going to be satisfied there with. The Bible teaches if they don't want to work, they shouldn't eat. Okay? So they ought to be put to death. It's a death sentence, isn't it? It's, that's capital punishment for their laziness and they're not wanting to work. And a righteous government would institute that because it would encourage everybody to get a job and to work and labor in the things that they ought to. So, it continues on and talks about these people, verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ that they with quietness or that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. It's amazing the people that aren't working are described as being disorderly, working not at all, busybodies. And if you spend any time in social media, you've noticed that the amount of busybody, um, disorderly behavior is pretty much skyrocketing. Also, just in your neighborhood, your 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 friendly neighborhood Karen is calling the police on people. Why? Because she's not working. She's become a busybody. She's not doing anything else. So she's going to look out the window and call the cops on somebody that's got, you know, three of their family members over. Right? So we're creating this mentality in our nation. Who wants to live in a nation that is disorderly? Who wants to live in a nation that is not working at all? That's just full of busybodies involved in other people's matters. I don't want to live in a nation like that. So it would be great if, if instead of just handing out checks to people that don't want to work, they would just give tax breaks to the people that do. I think that's kind of the way you should do it right now. If I was in charge, right? Give, give the, if you want to work, you're not going to pay taxes. You'd have people lining up. Man, that would be great. My, my paychecks would be wonderful. Everyone that worked hard would have wonderful paychecks. But God specifically, and in his economy, would have it that if you didn't labor, you'd be put to death. Or you'd starve yourself to death. Uh, laboring at the wrong time. Go to Exodus chapter 20. So there is a penalty in the, in the area of serving God when you labor not at all. There's also penalty for laboring at the wrong time. Exodus chapter 20. And in verse 8, Exodus 20 and verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Go to Exodus chapter 31. So God, because that's what he did as an example created in six, rest of the seven. He ordained that as one of the Ten Commandments. That is what you would do as well. Six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest. Verse, chapter 31 and verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So not only does the Sabbath provide a rest, but it also puts a knowledge in your head that it's God that sanctifies you. 
Verse 14, it says, You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. I love that because Jesus is going to highlight that point later. The Sabbath is holy unto you, the person, the man. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days, six days may work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. He goes on to say, this is a sign between me and you. This is an agreement between me and you, Israel, that we will continue in this thing. It is a sign between us and the children of Israel. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. So, why rest? Because he did. Why rest? Because it puts the proper place of, of holiness in that you know that God has been the one that sanctifies you. God is the one that sets you apart. This is like an agreement where the people of Israel stop laboring because they're saying, this is the mark of, of the fact that I am belonging to God. I belong to the Lord. So, <clears throat> this is their outward circumcision essentially. This is my Sabbath. This is the day that I'm setting apart. I'm not doing any work on that day. Now, Numbers chapter 15, we can go there quick. Numbers chapter 15 gives us an example of this. Numbers chapter 15. And in this example, the wrong thing is done. It's got off to this. It gives us a negative example. Numbers chapter 15 and in verse 32, it says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks in the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto the congregation. Gathering sticks, that's not a big deal. Is that really work? Is that really labor? The principle here is that he was to not do any labor on the Sabbath day. And nevertheless, here he is gathering up a few bundles of sticks. Verse 34, it says, And they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, and you know what he's appealing to here is his scriptures. He says, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died, as the Lord commanded Moses. So there's an example of working at the wrong time. God said rest, and instead of resting that seventh day, getting all of the work that you needed on the Sabbath day done on the sixth day, and carrying that over so you could properly rest and set aside that day for God and for, and for um, giving proper uh, authority to Him in that area, instead of doing something, He labored, and God said, put Him to death. And if you're laboring at the wrong time, according to the Old Testament specifically, you ought to be put to death for it. Now, is there a New Testament example of the Sabbath? Go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we'll start to learn from our Lord Jesus Christ about the nature of the Sabbath in the New Testament. Obviously, I'm not going to be exhaustive on this because we're running out of time very quickly. John chapter 4 and verse 31. John chapter 4 and verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say ye not, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And welcome to the New Testament. Jesus is laboring so much that they're like, Master, eat. You've got to eat something. And as you read a book like Mark, and I'll have you go there and go to Mark uh, chapter 2. But as you look at a book like Mark, you find just constantly disciples are like, Lord, take a rest. Lord, eat something. Lord, take a break. Come on, Lord. You need to eat something. You need to take care of yourself. You're out of your mind. You're, you're just busy, busy, busy. And as you read that chapter, there'll be just so many stories of healing and preaching and healing and preaching and working. And Jesus is setting forth the New Testament example that the fields are white unto harvest. I need to finish the Lord's work. So he is actually advocating the continual working in the New Testament, taking advantage of every opportunity to glean a field, to harvest a field, to work a field. So much the more, so much so that he's saying, the meat that I have, 
The provision that I have comes as a result of the work that I'm doing. My meat is to do the work. My food is to do the work. If any man work not, will not work, neither should he eat. Christ is eating the works that he's doing. He probably went about was gathering snacks and, 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 and stopping here and there for a quick break. But by and large, you find Jesus saying, hey, lift up your eyes. Harvest is here. Let's get to work. We don't have four months to sit around and do nothing. Let's get to work. Go to Mark chapter 2. How would you go there? Mark chapter 2 and verse 23. Mark 2 verse 23. Here's a specific example. And it came to pass as he went through cornfields on the Sabbath day. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. So they're going to a destination. It's on the Sabbath day. And they're gathering up corn and eating it as they go. As they went, they plucked the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger? He and they that were with him. How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful to eat but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is good for. The Sabbath was made for. And right around the same time that Jesus was preaching in John that you needed to be about the Father's business because the fields are ripe unto harvest, you find Jesus walking through a very field and eating as he went, just plucking up these ears of corn as he went. Why? Because he's trying to prove to them a fact, and he does it over and over and over and over, that the Sabbath is not the same way as you thought it was. It's not continuing on in the same way as you think it does. That's why Jesus was constantly preaching and teaching and healing and laboring on the Sabbath day. Was He's trying to show them, hey, that rest was holy unto you. That rest was set aside for you as a sign between you, physical Israel, and God and the nations that were around you. Since that nation is all but rejected at this point, follow after me. And what's Christ saying? I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I will give you rest. Come unto ye, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. I believe the same thing is true for the sustenance, the food, what's expected. You work, you work, you work, you work. Christ says, thank you for laboring for me. Let me, let me give you rest. Let me give you peace. Let me give you sustenance. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath is what Jesus is trying continually to affirm. Follow the Master. Follow the Master. Take every opportunity we have to labor in his field. That's what Christ is saying. It's ripe unto harvest. Now is the time to work. I must work while it is yet day. The night cometh when no man can work. So work. Amen. Laboring at the wrong time. Of course the Old Testament would have you put to death. But hey, now we're in the New Testament. The Sabbath doesn't apply to us. If you want to work seven days, get at it. It's healthy and wise to take a break. I take my break Sunday. I come to church. But it's not actually that much of a rest for me. Right? It spills into Monday usually. Monday can be a slower day for me where I kind of take a day to rest. Right? Take some break. There's wisdom in the scriptures when it talks about a Sabbath, but it's definitely not something that God has now ordained and would, in the New Testament, force men to do so. Okay? That's what I believe. The next is serving other gods. We're talking about sins of divine service. Clearly serving other gods. Doing, go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. We're going to find a whole chapter. Obviously, I'm preaching through Deuteronomy on Thursday, so I don't want to get too much out of it, but I just want to talk quickly. Clearly, divine service, God has his ways that we should do things. He has his men that he has chosen to do certain things. He's ordained uh, particular people for particular tasks. In the Old Testament, when people overstepped, they were, they were to be put to death by the congregation, or God would put them to death in particular. In regard to labors and, and toiling, work with your hands, God expects that you would be willing to work hard in order to provide for your needs. And if you don't, then you, you should just starve, because the whole purpose of work is to provide those needs. And God ordained that to be so way back in Genesis chapter 3. Laboring at the wrong time in the Old Testament, when the Sabbath day was on, uh, God would have have you put to death, stoned with stones by the congregation for even gathering some sticks on the Sabbath day. The next area of sinning and divine service is serving lowercase g gods. 
serving other gods in the place of the one true God and encouraging others to do the same is a great sin. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 13, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, let, and let us serve them. It's interesting because I actually dropped this exact passage of scripture into a Facebook group because somebody actually came and said, I was following Christ and he was, and he was, I was trying to get this thing out of my life, this sin or whatever. And she's like, I think she said she wanted her husband to come back or something. And she's like, I couldn't, I couldn't get leave of my, my husband. He's constantly rejecting me, rejecting me. She's like, but then I talked to this, this consultant and she divined. And like the next day my husband came back to me and here's her phone number. You should go call her. And, she, and I'm like, this is a Christian group. What in the world? And so I dropped that in there, and she was kicked out of the group. She was, according to the scriptures, bringing a sign of wonder that came to pass and saying, come on, come on, let us go serve other gods. Because because your your sins, God can't help you with. Your, your relationships, God can't help you with. But he, this guy, this other guy, he helped me, right? And so that's exactly the sin. And it says in verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. And obviously, I wasn't susceptible to that, but many are. Many weak in their faith or early on in Christianity, or even somebody that's kind of dabbling in the religion of Christianity, not quite saved or understanding, but maybe on the right path. The Bible says that you should not hearken unto them. We ought to be leery of these things and be on guard for these types of things so we can cut them off so they don't hurt others. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. Verse 6 it says, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or of the son of thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend. This is a pretty good list of very close people, right? Yeah. Which is as thine own soul. How much closer? Knit together by the very soul in the fabric of that. Entice thee as secretly, saying... Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of earth even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither th th shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him, to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more such wickedness as is among you. And so, currently, we don't have laws like this, nor should we enforce laws like this. The law of the land is still supreme under God. And so in an area like this where God in the context of verse 11 says, Israel shall hear, and this is Israel according to the flesh, the landmass that he was establishing, and the people under that nation that he was establishing when the law was given, they were to hear and fear and do no more because they put to death that soothsayer or that, that person that tried to thrust them away from the Lord that God. Currently in our nation, there is no law like this. And, and you know what, honestly... In some ways, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Why would I say that? Well, wouldn't law of God be great? Yeah, absolutely. It would be wonderful if that was the law of God, and then many generations would see and fear, and you wouldn't have to have these death penalties always happening. But since the law was in that case, I got a lot of grace. And I think some people even in this room would admit that there was a time in their life when they sought after, chased after, looked after other gods, right? Even encouraged other people to see other gods. We were talking to the other day about um, CrossFit, right? CrossFit, they're like, they're like evangelists, right? If anybody's doing CrossFit, you know they're doing CrossFit because they're going to tell you about CrossFit, right? They're going to invite you down to the CrossFit gym, right? A lot of people were like that in regard to fortune telling, in regard to, um, uh, what are they called? Hala, what are those? Horoscopes, right? In regard to different things, right? 
and following after other gods. And were it not for the religious liberty that we have, at least on paper in Canada, I would have been put to death. Some of us would have been put to death. We know people that would have been put to death for those certain things. So in some ways, I am, I am rejoicing over the liberty, the religious liberty that we have in this nation because some of us might have been put to death for our past, but the reality is, is that when God steps in and He ordains His nation upon earth for that thousand year millennial reign, this will be on the books again. You will not be able to go and talk about other gods. You will not be able to go and encourage other people to follow after gods. The law will be sure and, and swift in its execution. That if you do, you shall be put to death. And that's, that's the third point of, of, of put to death. And the, the how, if the God's nation was instituted here, we would find things uh, put uh, on paper and executed. So false prophets in our day are going to come to you. Right? That one came on Facebook, got her kicked out, whatever. Other people may come to you with the same thing. You may have family members that are saying, oh, you should try this, um, this, this religion. You should try that. You haven't tried everything. Read this horoscope. Right? They're going to come at you like that way. Approach them with love, respectfully, no thank you. Send them on their way. Right? Don't let them intrigue you with those things. But the big names, the false prophets, the ones that are, are, are boasting in false religion and trying to get others to join up, they will have their day. It's not like they're going to escape the death penalty, the capital punishment that is coming. God will eventually put them to death in hellfire forever, though it's not the law today. Their day is coming. We know in the Bible it records that there's going to be a false prophet and the beast thrown into a lake of fire, and he's going to take all that are following him and do the same with him. God will have justice upon this world that has turned unrighteously against him, but this is one of those things that if it were the law, I would rejoice in that. And, and it would be great to see because people would stop doing that. They would stop following after other gods. They would know that the Lord is God. But it's not in the books today, so all we can do is hope for the day will come when all false prophets will be destroyed and rid from this earth. And I'm thankful for you, God, Lord. I pray, God, that you.